If you're a fan of the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise, there's a really good chance that Sonic Adventure for the Sega Dreamcast and later re-released on other platforms may be one of your more liked Sonic games. And while Sonic Adventure has the reputation and distinction for bringing Sonic the Hedgehog into the 3D modern format that is incredibly popular for Sonic nowadays, I mean, it took a game series that looked like this and turned it into this and also this. For better or worse, the development behind Sonic Adventure and the effort to bring Sonic into the 3D platforming adventure genre definitely wasn't a simple task at Sega. Matter of fact, Sonic Adventure specifically had one of the most difficult development periods in all of Sonic history, or at least Sonic history up until that point. We can't just say that when games like Sonic 06 or Sonic Boom exist. But still, it's very fascinating to take a look at the development behind Sonic Adventure, because the lore here is actually pretty deep. Now, to best understand the state of Sonic and Sega back in the 90s, we had to go back quite a bit to the heights of the original retro Sonic classic days that were really popular. I mean, for years, back to back to back, Sonic was releasing some pretty big hits with Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic CD, Sonic 2, Sonic 3, Sonic and Knuckles. But still, overall, Sega was trying to compete with Nintendo and keep up with them, and Sonic was definitely their biggest franchise leader, giving the people a reason why they should get a Sega system. So after the completion of Sonic and Knuckles in 1994, Sega programmer and producer Yuji Naka returned to Japan and reunited with the original creator of Sonic the Hedgehog, Naoto Oshima. They would go on to form a brand new Sonic team which would begin work on a title that would be completely separate from the original Sonic concept. This game would end up becoming, drumroll please, Nights into dreams. Yeah, after spending years working on Sonic, they wanted to work on something different, and you can only imagine how that went over at Sega. Hey, we have this super successful game franchise finally getting off the ground. We want to take a break for a while and uh, work on something else. So with all of that in mind and the seniority that these two had, Sega still wanted a new Sonic game and assigned the remaining members of the Sega Technical Institute, that group that worked on Sonic and Knuckles, to work on a new Sonic the Hedgehog title, which would eventually pick up the title Sonic Extreme. Now, Sonic Extreme was Sega's first attempt at trying to figure out how Sonic could possibly work in a 3D space. Sony was already getting really good with 3D level design, and the Nintendo 64 with Mario 64 would be releasing in Japan in the summer of 1996. So to keep Sega Saturn sales up, they needed something big to show people People why Sega was still the way to go. Sonic Extreme ended up being a game that went through several storyline changes during its development, along with a decent chunk of leadership changes and general conceptual changes as to what a game like Sonic Extreme would be like. Now, the best known plot to this day is that in the story that would have been in this Sonic Extreme game, Sonic would receive a distress signal and he had to go retrieve something called the Rings of Order before Dr. Eggman does, and this storyline was kind of just quickly thrown together for a magazine feature that would kind of help promote the game a bit. I don't know, there are plans for things to involve Dr. Eggman coming in with the Death Egg, which would have been bigger than Earth, and Sonic has to go and get teleported and discovers there's some aliens being behind the whole thing. It was a little bit of a weird plot, and there was apparently even plans at one point to use some of the characters from the Saturday morning series Sonic the Hedgehog. Those plans never got too far. Ultimately, the game was trying to place Sonic in a completely 3D environment, which would encourage players to go anywhere or run through anything. Levels were designed in this tube-like manner and a fisheye lens was used to allow players to see more of their surroundings by adjusting the field of view. The game's lead designer, Chris Sen, originally wanted multiple playable characters and their own gameplay styles, but with time constraints and the fact that the development wasn't coming along too well, it seemed like the focus would shift back to being on Sonic for the core gameplay. There were some new moves also planned in there, such as a power ball and a Sonic boom attack, and the ability to even throw rings at enemies. This game was, of course, ambitious for the Sonic franchise, but with how 3D technology and gameplay in the 3D space was evolving rapidly, it was becoming apparent that if this game continued to have more energy put into it, it might end up looking more dated than necessarily cutting edge technology for their IP that's supposed to compete with Mario directly. With some of these development woes in mind, the game that was aimed for a November 1996 release date was pushed to December and then pushed to March of 1997, the Sonic Extreme project would end up being put on the shelf 
and its development would end before it ever saw a full release. Now, it is also worth noting that during the development time for this project, there were several different pitches and rewrites and a ton of ambitious ideas for what this game could have looked like, and maybe we'll cover more of that in the future, so make sure you're subscribed. But what's important to take away is that this project wasn't ever officially cancelled by Sega, but production on this game would completely restart behind closed doors. Now, as Sega was still trying to push out some level of Sonic portfolio to consumers to remind people that Sonic still existed. Some of the concepts that they had managed to build out for Sonic Extreme would be quickly repurposed and included as a bonus level called Sonic World in the Sonic Jam collection. And this would be the closest thing ever put to a full release of what this original idea for Sonic was. Though recent leaks actually suggest that the game was much further along in development than just what this actual essentially demo level for a cut game ended up actually being, and there's still hope that a later build of the game will one day release to show how far along this actually got. Now at this point, a restart in development was kind of imminent, and while this new 3D Sonic game started out with intentions of being built on the Sega Saturn, it seemed like they had to make the decision as to whether or not they were going to continue with development on the Saturn, or begin work on Sega's next system, which was at the time codenamed Katana. Ultimately, they made the decision to scrap what they had done for the Saturn and work on the game that would be one of the premier titles for the Dreamcast. It was around this time also that senior game designer Takashi Izuka, who worked on Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Sonic Knuckles, started pushing the idea of potentially making a Sonic RPG game that was more story driven, and strongly suggested that this new game should have a heavy emphasis on plot to set up Sonic for the long run. The development of Sonic Adventure at this point would also see the return of Yuji Naka and Naoto Oshima after they finished up their work on Night into dreams, and to help find inspiration for some of the world building that would be featured in Sonic Adventure, the development team actually ended up traveling to Central and South America to try to get some inspiration for some of the game's worlds by going to areas in Mexico and Peru. They looked at some real life locations, filmed and took pictures of everything they saw, and many of these images were later used to create realistic locations in the game. Some of the textures found in the games were lifted straight from the team's collected photographs. For instance, the sand hill level in Tails' version of the game was an idea that was inspired by their trip and was not a part of the original plan for the game. Though not everything was necessarily smooth on this trip, there was a couple of issues that came up while they were journeying out here to get information and ideas for Sonic Adventure. There was unexpected encounters with wildlife, and one team member reportedly suffered heavily from altitude sickness. The team returned to Japan still enthusiastic about creating this game and decided to redesign the principal cast to showcase the game's emphasis on story and realistic worlds. Yuji Iwakawa was recruited to draw the new character designs which were stylized and inspired by graffiti art, and drastic changes were made to some of the characters like Amy Rose and Dr. Eggman. Also to broaden the appeal of the game, new characters with unique playstyles would be introduced as playable characters, such as E-102 Gamma, who used targeting and shooting, and Big the Cat, who went fishing. Yeah, that was, that was a good decision. Decision. These new characters were designed to fit naturally within the Sonic universe in an attempt to bridge the gap with this new art style that was being introduced. Also in an attempt to add more features into the game, the Sonic Adventure team ended up bringing back a feature that was originally in Nights Into Dreams, known back then as A-Life Technology. This was reworked to essentially make a game within a game where players could raise little creatures called Chao. This Chao raising experience was intended to appeal to new players and serve as a fun Function that would promote replaying through the game, as you would want to raise your Chao and acquire skills to make your Chao better. Towards the later part of development rearing up towards release, in 1998, a fuzzy and blurry screenshot of the game ended up leaking, and essentially a lot of Sonic fans and the public in general were getting pretty excited about whatever Sega had been working on in secret for quite some time. In August of 98, in Tokyo, there was a special unveiling event featuring Yuji Naka and two Japanese radio personalities that presented live gameplay and some pre-recorded videos showing the game's style, some new characters, and the emphasis on storytelling. Sonic Adventure would be shown off as one of the biggest and most exciting launches that would coincide with the Dreamcast finally releasing, though it seemed like Sonic Team really needed all of the time possible to try to get this game polished and released before holiday 1998, and that would be something they would eventually 
2022, barely, as the game would release December 23rd, just two days before Christmas Day in 1998. After the release of the Japanese version of the game, the Sonic team members ended up traveling to Sega of America in San Francisco to polish up Sonic Adventure for its Western release. It was decided that the Japanese canon would be the official story for Sonic, and a deal was even made with Hollywood Video for game rentals before the game was officially released. There was already a ton of buzz around Sonic Adventure releasing, and people were pretty excited. Mind you, this time around, Sonic Adventure would be ready to launch alongside the Dreamcast in the West. Sonic Adventure would see its release in the West in September of 1999 and was both a commercial and critical success. It actually marked the final game created by Naoto Oshima, the character's creator, who ended up leaving the company due to disputes over the direction of the Sonic franchise after this game. And it seemed like there was maybe some bad blood there because when the decision was made for this game to be ported later on, his name was seemingly removed from the credits of the GameCube port of this game. While at the very beginning it seemed like things might have been going well for the Sega Dreamcast, especially with Sonic Adventure being a hit title, the life of the Dreamcast ended up not going all that great. There's probably a reason why we don't still see Sega consoles nowadays. The Dreamcast had to see its price slashed multiple times over the following years after its release, and while the Sega team was working on a follow-up title, Sonic Adventure 2 working out of Sega of America still in San Francisco, the Dreamcast really struggled to manage to compete with the other gaming consoles on the market, especially against Sony's PlayStation 2, which was just hugely popular. It had a built-in DVD player, which mind you was a very big selling point back in the day, and two sticks! Look at that, right there, there's two thumbsticks where Sega Dreamcast only had one. Sure, the Dreamcast had the little VMU thing that nobody really used, but two sticks on the PlayStation 2 controller. With the writing on the wall for the Dreamcast, Sega would have to do a pretty massive restructuring with their company moving forward, and eventually would opt into choosing not to continue to make hardware moving forward, and ended up making a very unexpected deal just a few months after it was announced that the Sega Dreamcast would be ending, and after Sonic Adventure 2 released on the system. Nintendo, their biggest rival for the existence of practically all of Sonic's franchise history, would crack a deal with Sega to bring ports of the Sonic Adventure games over to the GameCube system exclusively. Both Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 would get the chance to be cleaned up and overhauled a little bit, such as new features added like graphical enhancements, a new mission mode, an improved Chow Garden, essentially the definitive version of the games, would be released on the Nintendo GameCube. This, for the first time ever, introduced the Sonic franchise to a whole new audience that had never experienced Sonic games before as maybe there were Nintendo kids growing up. I didn't have a Dreamcast as a kid, I didn't know who Sonic was until Adventure 2 Battle, and mind you, these were successful games on the GameCube even. Despite the fact that the original version of Sonic Adventure had come out essentially in 1997, that would have made it six years old at that point, and it still looked pretty solid, it looked like a current gen game at the time. And I think that's a pretty big testament to the legacy that Sonic Adventure was able to create. Sure, the game wasn't perfect, there were a ton of bugs, especially on the GameCube version of the game, but I don't think that stopped people from appreciating the game, enjoying the variety and having different characters, this interesting story, and really just focusing on the narrative direction of how they wanted to tell the game's story. Boom, but that wasn't all for Sonic Adventure, as Sega really needed to kind of recoup some of their money, so they actually released the game another time just one year later for Windows PC. They were trying to get their mile with this game. Later on in 2010, Sonic Adventure would also see another release, this time on Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3 marketplaces, giving players the option to choose if they wanted to upgrade to the Director's Cut version, which was more in line with the GameCube release, or stick to the original version of the game. And then one year later, in 2011, they released the game again. Again, this time basing it off of the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 Marketplace versions, but on Steam. I think Sonic Adventure was a really big deal. It was something unlike anything that we've seen from like games making the leap from 2D to 3D. This game took the idea of making a 3D adaptation based on the original core source material and just flipped it on its head. It went extremely hard, it went way, way over the top, and I think people really appreciated that. It was the fast-paced experience you 
you would want from a Sonic game, but also it was uh, an adventure too, with all the different characters and whatnot. I think the story and the tension and the stakes really helped kind of polish everything all together, because the game did have a lot of odds and ends and weird things going on with it, and I think the fact that there was a story motivating players to continue on and progress to see what would happen next really helped players continue to enjoy the game even if they were struggling with something along the way. Sonic Adventure would end up being the basis for the future of 3D Sonic games pretty much moving forward. Not only was Sonic Adventure 2 obviously directly inspired by the first one, but Sonic Heroes, Shadow the Hedgehog, Sonic 06 especially, even Sonic Unleashed was quoted to be inspired by the original Sonic Adventure game. I think we'll see over the course of following years how the gameplay surrounding Sonic himself would evolve but still stay rooted in what Sonic Adventure did in bringing Sonic to this 3D perspective and even newer games like Sonic Lost World still have little hints of what made Sonic so special back in the day. You can still light speed dash which is something introduced in Sonic Adventure that's still a part of the gameplay even nowadays in Sonic Frontiers. Besides the legacy alone that Sonic Adventure would end up having moving forward there'd be a lot of other things that took Sonic Adventure as a core storytelling element. For instance Sonic Adventure would end up causing the entire television series Sonic X to take note from the plot lines introduced in that game and recreated in anime form, which was pretty awesome to see. They ended up continuing on and doing that with Sonic Adventure 2 as well. And of course, I find it always fascinating seeing how Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 were created back to back essentially, but the differences in pacing and tone and how they chose to approach Sonic Adventure 2 based on what they learned when making Sonic Adventure 1 almost makes Sonic Adventure 2's existence that much more interesting. You can see a direct continuation and the thought processes of a lot of things introduced in the first title and how it was transformed in the second title. The first title had these open world sections that were really integral to the game. The second title did away with them altogether to try to streamline the gameplay. There was a lot of differences in how they approached multiple characters, trying to make it where the gameplay felt varied, where you're not replaying the same levels over and over again as just different characters, which really contributed to the pacing in Sonic Adventure 2 being significantly different. But man, had Sonic Adventure not established the groundwork, I don't think Sonic would be as popular as he is today. So much of the universe, the lore, the idea of Sonic going Super Sonic in the way that he does in the newer titles was just based off of this. And while obviously the jump to 3D has led to circumstantial situations where Sonic may have a very cursed adventure in one way or another, we're looking at Sonic 06 right now when we say that, I think the fact that even the worst Sonic games, as goofy as they may be, the fact that they draw a lot of their inspiration from games like Sonic Adventure make those games worthwhile and make those games even more interesting than ever before. Sonic Adventure 2 specifically will be a game that we want to look at in the future and kind of understand its specific history because its history is unique in itself. There were some interesting things that were planned, scrapped, and rethought about during the development period of Sonic Adventure 2 even though its development period was significantly shorter. So if you'd like to see us do a deep dive into the history of Sonic Adventure 2's development, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, maybe leave a comment comment on this video on what your favorite part of Sonic Adventure was so the algorithm will be like hey this video is a banger and then send it out to more people but otherwise thank you guys so much for watching we do appreciate all the support and new subscribers if you guys feel like joining on otherwise that's it for today we'll see you all next time with a brand new video